question and so he is confused. All right, well, a poetry reading never begins on time, but we're pretty <laughs> good at 5.02, so we're gonna go ahead and get started, and if folks wander in, that is totally fine. So good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Fall 2022 Visiting Writer Series here at Brevard College. I would like to thank the Humanities Division and West Le Lecture Series Funds, which makes this reading series possible. Uh, and I would like to thank all of you for being here this evening. I met tonight's guest, Sarah Henning, almost eight years ago at a poetry reading. To be precise, it was the Taproom Poetry Series in the red party light filled basement of the 8th Street Taproom <clears throat> on a cold February evening in 2015 in Lawrence, Kansas. While that may not be surprising to many of you who know me, it's important for me to say this because poetry readings and other literary gatherings are one of the many places as writers we find community. Because after that, I reconnected with Sarah at the Great Plains Writers Conference at the University of South Dakota in Vermilion, South Dakota, where I learned some roads don't have speed limits. <laughs> And what seems like yesterday, we lived together for 10 days at the Swanee Writers Conference at the University of the South in Swanee, Tennessee, where we went through a roller coaster of experiences that I know have forever shaped our work. It was there when I first read and listened to the poems our guest was writing for her latest award-winning collection, Terra Incognita, winner of the 2021 Hollis Summers Poetry Prize from Ohio University Press. Sarah Henning's work is emotionally raw, technically marvelous, and has such a density to it that I could spend hours picking her minds apart. When I finally got my copy of Terra Incognita, I knew I was in trouble, a very good kind of trouble, upon reading the first lines of Terra Inferna. When my mother died, I dreamed of a man, rough sketching on gesso, palette knife scraping, the angles of a woman's face, he knuckles thin washes of color, the way a man might thumb through a woman, exalting her, erasing her. A record of grief and memory, Terra Incognita's extended elegy is a poignant example of how to write about difficult subjects, in this case, a mother's death. Sarah Henning distills complex emotions into poems that seethe with energy and vision. And I'll pause there, even though there's so much more to say. Instead, I'll let our guests say it. Everyone, please welcome Sarah Henning. That was a beautiful introduction. <laughs> that was, that was stunning. Friends, thank you for coming out on a Tuesday afternoon, early evening, to come enjoy some poetry. I'm so grateful for everybody in the room. I'm so grateful to Dr. Elise Bensel for the invitation. Um, when she asked me, I immediately said, yes, <laughs> let me come. This is going to be great. Um, but it's true. I want to second what Elise uh, said about um, poetry. Poetry is community. Poetry is sharing. Being able to come together in a room, that's, to me, um, what makes poetry special and so again I'm so glad that everybody's here tonight and I can't wait to share poems from Terra Incognita with you. Um, as, um, as Elise stated uh, this book has uh, an awful lot to do with uh, the passing of my mother. Uh, my mother passed away from stage 4 colon cancer in 2016 and during that time um, I felt like, in many ways, the world fell out from under me. Um, I felt that way in many ways because my mother was a single mother. We grew up in uh, rural Georgia in the 1980s and 1990s, and we didn't have a whole lot of money. And so in many ways, my mother always said that she and I were a team, right? And so she said, you know, no matter what, it's always going to be you and me against the world. And so when my mother contracted cancer when I was in my early 30s, um, and it became quite apparent that it would be aggressive, malignant, um, metastatic cancer, um, I just, I didn't know what to do. And for a long time, I didn't want to write about it. I didn't feel that I could write about it. In fact, 
my agenda every time I sat down to write was not to write about it until every time I sat down to write, guess what, I was writing about it. And so it seemed to me that um, when, when my mother passed away, I turned to other grief memoirs, mostly creative nonfiction. Cheryl Strait's Wild is a really beautiful one. Um, Megan O'Rourke's The Long Goodbye is beautiful. Um, there's, there's, you know, uh, Mark Doty's Heaven's Coast is lovely. Uh, I could go on and on and on recommending books to you. And uh, anyone who hasn't read those, write them down. They're gorgeous. They're probably in the library. You should read them as soon as you can. But it, it, it began to make sense to me that I, if I could turn to those books to help me, not necessarily situate my grief and understand the depth of my grief, but to sort of have a manual of what grief meant and how it meant to pass through to the other side of it, then I wanted to become a part of that legacy. I wanted to become a part of that literary community. And so that is how Terra Incognita was born. It's separated into four sections, and I'm going to read from three of them this evening. And I'll contextualize each of the sections just a little bit as we go forward, keeping time in mind. The first section is called Terra Inferna, which is literally uh, translates from Latin for hell on earth. And um, it is a section in which the speaker um, confronts the very harsh realities of her, of her, mother's, of her mother's death and in many of its raw qualities. And incidentally, uh, I was thrilled that um, the Dr. Bensel uh, quoted Terra Inferno because that was one of the poems that I know that her introduction to creative writing students, many of which I see in the audience tonight, read, and I had planned to read to you all. Um, this may be a little bit of um, of repetition for folks who, uh, who were in the class I visited this afternoon, but some necessary information. Uh, it features a story by uh, artist Joe Ando, who painted images of horses and nudes with the same face after um, his girlfriend died in a fire. So out of the, uh, sort of out of the proverbial blue, he started painting horses and painting horses and painting horses. And, you know, he went through his horse period and then he went through his, um, his uh, his nude nude period, where all, all of these all of these young women had the same face, and it came to be that um, his uh, his girlfriend had died in a fire, and so there was this moment where a horse had stuck its head through the window when he and his girlfriend had had cut high school to uh, spend time together in a field, um, and there was this moment of fear and delight that. I, in some ways he kept returning to um, instead of focusing on the grief of loss. So, Terra Inferna. When my mother died, I dreamed of a man rough sketching on gesso, palette knife scraping the angles of a woman's face. He knuckles thin washes of color the way a man might thumb through a woman, exalting her, erasing her. He's famous for his horses, hunger-hardened and sensual, pupils blown open by violence or love. Others thrash with their hooves, escapists hurling forward. I dreamed of the teenage girl always ghosting the interior, cut off blue jeans, black camisole, smoke clenching her body in its silt halo. There's a Zippo next to her, a crushed pack of lucky strikes. Her off-frame stare says, listen, it says, I want to tell you everything. Once, a mare thrust her muzzle into the shotgun window of his 1967 Chevy Nova. This was years ago, Tulsa, a whole afternoon of hooky in the field off Route 66 by the high school. Rabbits tonguing the husks off of sweet corn. His back sunburned as raw prayer as the radio pulses Van Morrison. The girl in the back seat offering him her body. The mare's face in the window is a flash, a sudden weapon. 
She could break the young man, reaching for her, crush his hands with her jaw. She could bite the girl until her skin gapes and slips, flesh pooling in plush knots. I think of this image when I close my eyes, a girl so lovely it hurts to look at her, a mare wild enough to end everything, a mane that smells like sex, prairie fire, rabbits seething their death song into the glare. The man will call it some heart's undoing, as if to repeat the thing you most want will keep it holy. Like the night his girl falls asleep, her cigarette glimmering. He won't be able to unsee it. Her soul lunging its muscled heat into air, screams chased down by darkness. Or the mare, always the mare, feral elegy he'll snare into oil. Her mane so light tangled, it could be burning. So from the same section, um, I'm going to read Elegy with Saltwater Taffy, which definitely changes the tone up a little bit. Um, I grew up in Savannah, Georgia, um, so I am not unfamiliar with this region where we, where we are existing right now. Um, and one of my favorite activities in the entire world was walking on River Street. Please raise your hand if you've been to River Street. Thank you, awesome. Okay, to visit the sweet shops because they had candy. And so this, this poem is based on an early memory with my mother and it's a memory that makes me incredibly happy even to this day. Elegy with Saltwater Taffy. River Street Suites, Savannah, Georgia, 1984. You could say we came, my mother and I, to watch the aproned man pour his tincture of cornstarch and sugar onto the metal table, waited until it hardened enough to be touched. You could say we waited for him to move it to the stretching machine, to wrestle and press the melon spice candy against the iron arms. You could say it amazed us, the physics of it, how something so simple could soften and harden like the whims of the body. We watched him conjure taffy into snake-like ropes, feed it into a hundred-year-old machine which cut then folded each piece into wax paper. But really, we came for the pieces he flung in us, how they arched in parabolas or shot like fastballs over our heads. I loved it when I could catch one. Warmth still radiating, paper skin, the shape my mouth made around it. And after I'd begged my mother to walk by the river until my flip-flops burned the ridges between my toes, seagulls scattering when we came too close. Even now, I relish the salt and sugar still kindling together. Sweat luscious body and taffy. I can still taste the sea. I couldn't come to a school in the Appalachian Mountains without reading a mountain poem. <laughs> so after my mother and I moved away from Savannah, we, um, we moved to Athens, Georgia, where her parents were living, which is about, a, I'd say, a 90-minute drive, maybe about six, I'd say between 70 and 90 minutes away from the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains. And so um, the beauty of the Great Spooky Mountains, I mean, just they just called to me in a way I didn't have words for. I thought they were incredible. Um, so I begged my mom to drive there. Um, to White County, and I would just look at them clustering in the, in the mist. And so, I just, I mean, I was a little kid, but I thought there was something really mythic to that beauty. Um, clearly, I didn't have any geological frame of reference. I didn't know how mountains were made. Um, 
you know. So like kids, you know, we're guided by our imaginations. So I invented my own origin stories. So this is a prose poem for folks in the room. What is a prose poem? It's a poem that does, that, that's in a paragraph form, right? It doesn't necessarily have line delineations. So elegy beginning with the birth of a mountain. White County, Georgia. You believe that a mountain comes gaunt and shivering. Some sleek brute born from the void of chaos. When you close your eyes, you can almost see it. Each salt-glossed body rapturing itself up from the earth. Giant cow elks birthed in the middle of a gorge. You beg your mother to drive the hour to White County so you can linger at the Chevron station, staring at mountains and drinking Cokes. Around you, farmhouses lean into the September heat. They haunt the landscape, derelict, all plank and radiant tin. Cemeteries go rogue on the side of the road. You didn't know that to love a mountain is to hold a language of violence in your mouth. Tectonic plates gashing each other. Hot magma, erosion. You aren't that kind of child. The animal sky, you once said, is love turned inside out. You are ready to coil your fingers around your binoculars, to believe in a field of view inversely proportional to their magnifying power, ready to believe in their angular value, how many degrees will hold you and for how long. What you see, ridges erased by haze, oaks heat-threatened radiating isoprene, gas smattering the sky. Like the trees, you're seized between beauty and blue's hazard, the ridges' tawny girth and the surge of the soul. So nakedly rising, it could be joy or sadness. Remember, you once called the sky dusk raw. Later, you'll want a world where tumors in your mother's body mean proud mountains move within her. All right. So this next one is still in the first section. Um, I think I'm reading so many from the first section just to kind of give everyone a frame of reference for the, the project. Um, so my mother and I did not, my mother did not raise me with much money. After my father passed away, uh, she was a single parent. And um, if the meagerness of poverty intensifies love and devotion, I think it also magnifies the rituals that we, that we form to um, find deep pleasure, especially in the wake of struggle. So, um, you know, we all have those rituals with our, with our parents or our caregivers or, you know, or our family. Um, for me, uh, my mother, it was sharing a bag of French fries from, say, McDonald's or Crystal, if you're familiar with that chain, on very hard days. And so that, uh, that matters because that, um, that ritual of going will change context in the poem I'm about to read you. French fries. When I say lesions in my mother's lungs, not the CT scan, like a field of thistle. I mean she's haunting the drive through at the nearest crystal, a grease slick bag of French fries enchanting the air. I mean a nurse stitched up the port in her chest where chemo once flooded dressed the sight with surgical glue, her throat closing over the word terminal. When I was young, hard days meant cruising after school with a fast food sack between us, my mother tearing the paper to cool the shards, a fever slick spud we'd crush with our molars, exhaust from the muffler 
thrumming through the windows, magnolias murmuring its sweep ripe song through us. I want to remember her like this, radio blaring, mother grasping fries like slivers of pleasure, miles soaked in the heat bleach of bird bones that elicit salt. All right, so, um, the other day uh, I was giving a reading for an MFA residency with Kelly Russell Agadon, and um, we decided to braid our reading together into what's called a living elegy, or not, not living, living, a living anthology, a living anthology. And so what's a living anthology? Well, we, um, we chose some themes and we read poems back and forth to each other, and it was a lot of fun. And it got me reading a poem that I, I never really read at readings, or at least haven't read it very much so far. I think never is a, never is a, a big word. But I hadn't read it as, as frequently. And, um, and so I read it that evening, and, um, and everyone, you know, everyone enjoyed hearing it. And then come to find out Dr. Bensel assigns it as, as one of the readings. So I'm like, well, gosh, now I have to read this thing that I haven't read very much, which I think is good because I think sometimes poets um, and writers can read from the same material sometimes. Like, I mean, they have their kind of set list, but I really think it's good to give each, each piece its, its due during readings and let folks experience it. So this one is called God, You Are a Muscadine, and it takes to task the way that we carry our experiences of love with us from one relationship to another. In it, the speaker's husband um, is ill with a not yet diagnosed kidney stone, and it, this experience prompts a flashback in the speaker to her mother's terminal health crisis, and the poem has a turn, as many poems do at some point, um, it turns into a philosophical meditation on love and how we love. And it also mentions um, a line from the famous poet John Donne. So, this is God, you are a muscadine. Lord, your sweet is sharp husked, a hymn slipped over a battery of seeds to sow. I can see them untrust beneath your rupture of sugar, Lord. You've tethered me to that heaven of soothing. I've bitten through every mercy to get to it, but you are the stone, witch stone in the dark. Lord, the pit in my husband's kidney, its whirl on the MRI fixed into crystal, and I'm thinking how in the bathroom, Lord, he was like a boy, my husband, arched around the toilet. When I snatched him up, all bear hug and fisted collar, wrestled him, puking into my car, ER nurses threaded his veins with needles, anointed his chest with monitors, unleashed an IV drip of morphine into his blood. It was hours until the three millimeter mine at the center of his kidney was snitched out. Little coup of calcium set to bivouac his urethra. Its plan to rage through his sweet shaft until the stone crested loose. Yes, to translate the stone in my husband's Kidney is to translate a world unknown to me. I think of the cells in my mother's body, how cancer slunk between lymph and vessel like a thief. Cancer drifting fugitively through the skein of capillary after capillary. My mother made a force by her father's, my father's hands. So skilled was she at sassing disaster. When I said something's wrong, when I said the word doctor, she came at me. What I mean is she was not my mother, 
but an animal slashing, delirious, until I shut my mouth. But my husband, oh Lord, I shunted his body into my car. No alibi could blunt that pain radiating out of him because my love is sharp husked as yours, Lord. Another hymn of hardness that could begin or end a world like you, like you, Lord. If you're thinking of taking him, if you're dead set on carrying him into an air other than mine, you'll have to drown me in a sea of locusts. You'll have to batter my heart, Lord. You'll have to kill me if you want to carry him home. All right, two more from the last section, and then we're, and then we're done. Um, I like to write a lot in form, poetic form. Not, not to be fancy, but because it's really um, an interesting exercise in giving oneself the constraints to try to say what one is attempting to say, which sometimes is large and nebulous and vast. And um, anyway, it gives, it gives me a container to put my thoughts in sometimes. So um, terra firma is the name of the villanelle, and it's the name of the final section of the book. And that means the earth under one's boots, right? So in some ways, by this point, the speaker has found a sense of solid ground. And this poem is a love song for the complexities of survivorship. Um, a villanelle is a, is a French form, right? And it's got five tercets and a closing quatrain, which sounds really um, complicated until you just start doing it and you recognize that what it's formed itself into is a kind of a song. And for me, writing in form, especially after my mother passed away, made a lot of sense to me because form at times, particularly the villanelle, is it tends to be kind of circular. And my grief was very circular during that time. Um, in the way that um, I was navigating all of these things that come after death, filing taxes, estate lawyers, a, a, you know, a, a medical power of attorney, executrix of wills. I mean, it's this, it's this, this grand schema, ordering death certificates. Um, so this is terra firma. I sink my heels into darkness, that silky tether. Grief is an island of mercy touching my skin. It hurts like hell to bury your mother. Longing is my other story, not cancer, not coma hushing her into its dirty hymn. I sink my heels into darkness, that silky tether. Too wicked to die, I thought she'd live forever. She seethed all night on cigarettes and gin. It hurts like hell to bury your mother. I swallowed her storm as if love was duty, not weather. Surges, riptides, brazing my heart with her din. I sink my heels into darkness, that silky tether. I hated the menthol scenting her black leather jacket. I still tangle my body up in its sensuous sin. It hurts like hell to bury your mother. What is pain but a story of mercy? It lingers in my blood. All things end to end again. I sink my heels into darkness, that silky tether. It hurts like hell to bury your mother. All right, last one. So as a, as a writer, as a poet, um, I'm particularly attracted to books and let's just say maybe also fascinated with projects that uh, attempt to establish a sense of order. Um, I think that these orders are interesting. It's like encountering flowers in the wild or different species. Um, you know, there's these wonderful, elaborate, embellished things that just have these organic orders and I, I it 
makes me incredibly happy to figure out what those orders are. Um, for some, that means using a framing device. Um, for some, it means allowing images to form a concordance. For some, it means separating sections based on theme or lyric development. Um, so this last poem I'm reading uh, is called Winter Gazebo, and it uses an echoing frame um, to summon images from the first poem I read for you tonight, uh, Terra Inferna. So again, I want to say it before, I, I, while well, I still have the chance, thank you so much for coming tonight. You all are wonderful. Winter Gazebo, Madison, South Dakota. The sky, it's full of ghosts. When we married here, azaleas swung from the ceiling joists. Our vows hung low, my body singed by their earthly haunt. Love, it beat itself into the shingles. We had not yet made metaphors for what would clench its story between us in another season. Icicle lights flashing such fire. Christmas wreaths wretched as iridescent fruit. If light enters ice, ghost-like, it arrows back. Once gussied up in lace, I fell into us. Azalea crush. Desire, I thought, was the end. Now, wind-lashed, we lean on rails. We are past joy, past that feral elegy calling to us. Our shadows entangle, make love in the snow, as if love could bruise us beautiful. Thank you. For that wonderful reading. We now want to open it up to Q&A from the audience. Um, our other mic isn't working uh, currently. You've had some tech issues, so if you could um, just, uh, if you need to project, and you can also repeat the question, and I'll try to re-summarize as well as needed. So do folks have questions for Dr. Heading? I know there were some unasked ones from creative writing students earlier today, but for newcomers as well. They don't have to be about the project. They can be about the writing life. They can be about yeah. living in West Virginia. They can be about being <laughs> from, kind of from the Appalachian region. Any and all things are just fine, yeah. friends. Um, what I would like to ask is, as a writer yourself, um, what writer inspires you the most and which one do you not like oh. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Is it Mel? Yes. See, I remember your name. I love oh, I loved reading I loved hearing your work this afternoon. Thank you. Yeah. I, I think that is such a difficult question to answer because I have so many folks that I gravitate toward and love intensely. Um, I'm finding myself really excited and, and entranced by folks who are writing into um, sort of the neo-formalist tradition these days as a way to sort of write back against like patriarchy and all the sort of old sort of ways that like say sonnets for instance were which were oftentimes these kind of obsessive um, gross uh, love anthems to women that you know weren't even available often or were dead. Um, and, and so like I love reading people like uh, Allison Joseph. Um, she's amazing. She's just a wonderful neoformalist. She has such an, uh, a, a good ear for form. Patricia Smith um, writes these beautiful socially uh, relevant, uh, like so social activism poems um, that, that utilize form in, in interesting ways. Diane Seuss just won the Pulitzer Prize for this groundbreaking work of sonnets called Frank Sonnets, and I suggest everybody in this room check it out. Um, I mean, I don't know. I feel like everybody has their people that they don't maybe resonate with. Um, I find though, and here's, here's my, you know, here's my around, roundabout answer and I swear I'll get to it, Mel. Um, I feel like oftentimes when we have someone we don't vibe with, it's because sometimes we bring in 
preconceptions to what we're reading. And we allow those preconceptions to cloud um, our ability to open our mind to consider that that's another way to approach things. Um, I know for me, I found when I first started reading um, language poetry or like elliptical poetry, um, I found myself, you know, kind of hesitating a little bit because I, you know, being someone who's very lyrical, very kind of post-confessional, you know, I love my Sharon Olds, you know, I love, I love my um, I, uh, Anne Sexton and my Sylvia Plath. And, you know, in some ways I think I was early on in the process holding on to those notions. And in fact, reading all of that work helped me as a writer to expand my horizon and think about what's popular. However, I will say that poets and writers who um, actively do things to hurt other writers, those are the people that I have uh, very, really no interest in, in dealing with. Um, so that, you know, I don't know. There, there's a few people that come to mind, but I would say that um, most writers that you're gonna meet are going to be kind, empathetic human beings, but there are some that will, you know, that will not be such nice folks, and those are the people that I, you know, have a hard time separating the quality of the work from the quality of the person, let's just put it that way. So, yeah, that was my kind of like roundabout answer, Mel. Does that work for you? That works for me. Okay, okay. Especially with Terra Incognito, I'm curious about your relationship with spirituality, yeah. as, like particularly as the speaker, not necessarily as a person. Yeah. Um, when you use Lord so frequently, is it a secular Lord? Is it about the musicality of it? I'm just curious, like, where that speaks to you. That's such a great question. Um, what's your name? I'm Sarah. Sarah. Same. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Um, yeah, no, I mean, I was raised uh, in a Methodist household. Uh, my father's family was Catholic, my mother's family was Methodist. Um, definitely raised in a Judeo-Christian home. Um, my mother kind of went away from that in a lot of ways, I think, because of how it was taught to her by her parents. Um, for me, I have always found that when I when I write in my journal, when I'm writing poetry, sometimes I'm, I'm, I'm writing, I find myself writing to specific people um, and so in some ways my poems become letters. But particularly I found when writing this, this project, which I would say ha definitely has a lot of, um, of religious references, I think that's because in many ways I felt like I was having a conversation with God. I wanted to, to know why things happened in the way that they did. Um, you know, I think many people will sometimes question their relationship with faith when bad things happen. Um, for some it breaks the, that relationship and for some it strengthens it. I would say for me it definitely strengthened it. Um, I definitely have heard poets say that writing poems is one way to pray and I would say that that's definitely something that I would agree with. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Riley, that's the million dollar question. <laughs> that's the million dollar question. And I tell you, you know, especially now that we are year, year what of COVID, right? Year what of the pandemic, um, where I, a lot of people are exhausted, right? Um, I think it is difficult to quantify what a writing ritual should look like. And I know that when I was going up through school, you know, I had people tell me, you know, these, these, you know, if you're not writing every day, you're not a writer, or oh, let me think of some other sort of toxic productivity I heard. Mm -hmm. If you don't get it up at five o'clock in the morning and write for at least two hours, you're not a writer. So I was thinking, well, gosh, I guess I have a couple of award-winning books. I guess I must not be a writer because yeah. I don't get up at five in the morning to write. Um, I think, I think the thing, the thing that excites me, um, in addition to being a writer, I am a passionate, educator and the work that we did in class today Riley um, where I we do these these um, 
these generative writing assignments where um, you know they're timed writing and everybody writes together. I will I, I get excited watching my students get excited about writing, and I will oftentimes write with them. So sometimes when I feel like I'm in a creative um, creative fallow period, I will I will sort of watch my students fall in love with writing particularly my introduction to creative writing students. And it reminds me that there was a time that I felt that and that I can still feel that. And when I'm in the midst of a project, I do feel in love with my writing. Um, I find that I, when I end a project, like when Tara ended, um, it was hard for me to, I needed to take some time to reconnect, right, to another project. And I think sometimes, um, Toxic productivity says, well, you have to immediately jump onto your next project or else, or else, or else, or else. And I think that there's something to be said about giving yourself space to refill the well. Um, there's something to be said about um, spending time with your family members, your hobbies that you enjoy, um, giving your brain a little bit of a break. Um, so, and I also am a big believer in finding the ritual that works for you. And that really, you know, for some, that is going to be getting up at five o'clock and writing every day, and that's not, and I'm not saying that that's not the right way to do it. If that's what works for somebody, I will I will support that. Um, but I also want to tell folks who, you know, maybe they maybe they like to write from seven to nine at night. Okay, that's good. Maybe they only manage that three or four times a week. Okay, over the span of several months or several years, that's a lot of writing. That's pretty cool. I think setting realistic goals for ourselves and not beating ourselves up when we don't, you know, do things perfectly. That's the way to keep writing and not psyching and not psych ourselves out of not writing. So, yeah, it's a good question. Awesome. Well, I think we'll, we'll leave it at that um, for the uh, Q&A portion, but if you do have additional questions you'd like to ask Dr. Henning, um, we do have Highland Books here with two of uh, Sarah's poetry collections for sale, her most recent Terra Incognita, and then also View from True North. So you are welcome to uh, purchase a book, or if you already have one, you can get it then signed, or you can just come up and chat. Uh, I do want to let you all know that our next Visiting Writer Series event will feature memoirist Lucy Bryan on Tuesday, October 4th from 5 to 6 p.m. Not here, but in Jones Library. We have a little bit of a venue change. So please stay afterward to get a book, get it signed, or just chat, and we hope to see you next time. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for coming. I remember this one with Swanee. I was like, I'm so worried about them. And I was just like, you're going to just I was, I mean, I was, I, I don't know, I felt like I, I was too, I was too close to you. I was too close to you. Yeah, so Sarah, Sarah.